Hello listeners and welcome to part two of this week's mini-series on The Commune with Adam Dudding. I'm your speaker Casey and in this second and final part of my interview with Adam, we discuss Adam's podcast journey and more about Bert Potter's Centrepoint. For early access to full-length ad-free episodes, please visit patreon.com forward slash the cult vault. Now here is Adam Dudding from New Zealand's Stuff Podcasts. We did a cross-promotion for our shows and I, uh, my podcast entered the top 100 for true crime podcasts in Australia and New Zealand at the time that my cross promotion was running on the commune. So it can right. only oh, be right. that, that, that really put my podcast into the charts. So I think that's quite telling on the impact that your show was having at that time yeah. in that part of the world. Um, so I'm, of course I'm, I was excited. I <laughs> it's, it's great. From start to finish, how long do you think this pro- this 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 project took overall? Well, that figure changes on whether I'm trying to maximise it to sort of you know show work done or minimise it to my um, managers to sort of work around the fact that it just took so long. Um, from thinking about it as something that might be doable through to finishing it is probably about two and a half years, but um, there was like a month up front and then into the bottom drawer for a month for a number of reasons, then pulling it back out again. And then uh, at that point, uh, hooking up with Eugene Bingham um, and the two of us started working on it probably half time for about six months. And then the two of us sort of full time for about another nine months. So lots and lots and lots of labor. Um, it was just a lot to do, a lot of people to interview, um, a lot of things to transcribe, a lot of tapes to transcribe, you know, probably mi- literally millions of words of documents to get through because there's been quite a lot of court cases, um, a lot of press coverage, uh, you know, there's this 260 odd page report done by some academics uh, looking into the um, the after effects on the children of Centrepoint. So it's just, just lots and lots of stuff. There's a lot of information out there and, it, and it's the stories, um, it's kind of, 30 years in the telling in a way you know it starts 1978 and we're talking to people in 2020 who so it's 40 years isn't it um who are still you know bent out of shape scarred struggling ruined limping um or recovering from from what happened to them i think that's quite telling with with barry's journey through the podcast as well not just through her existence in center point but you know her talking through her own personal recollections of how the commune came to be what happened oh. how it all oh. fell apart it there's a there's a focus on her life since center point and where she is now and i think that's really important to highlight because on this show when i speak to survivors of coercive control it's important to look at how they've identified certain things that have been done to them, how they've worked through them or how they are working through them, not just for the education of the listeners, but also for the advice to others who might be going through similar things. So you do have elements of that in your show, as well as really telling the story of Centerpoint. So if anybody truly wants to understand the true the control and coercion that took place under Bert Potter's reign at Centrepoint, the escalation, the multiple, the, the polyamory or the polygamy, uh, the, the drugs that start to come in, the true nature of Centrepoint and the legacy that was left behind. All of those things are explored so perfectly in, in the 12 part series, The Commune, which you can go and listen to on all of your podcast players. Um, and I just wanted to to ask you a few more questions on whether you have any more projects lined up. Would you consider doing something of a similar nature or are you kind of um, are you done with cults? You've you've spent enough time in that space and you're you know happy to move away from that now. Well, uh, had to, uh, uh, yeah, well, <laughs> once once it was over, like I said, so we finished it around about February and then for reasonably complicated reasons, it didn't get released until about June. And when it was being released and we're having to just do a whole pile of extra labor to get the damn thing out. Um, I couldn't bring myself to listen to it again. 
at that point. And so that fell to Eugene to make sure that there were no terrible cock-ups that, that, that we hadn't spotted. So literally this weekend is the first time I've listened to it in about nine months. So it's, you know, I'm, I would never, ever, um, there were moments when there was one particular week where we'd done three or four pretty heavy interviews with, with some cult kids, you know, adult, former children of Centrepoint. And that told some pretty horrific stories. A lot of them were in the podcast, but actually, you know, we, we pulled back from a number of things. There's some, there's some worse stuff we didn't use because it was just like, oh, I don't think people need to hear this or people aren't going to, people are going to hit stop. Um, and that particular week, Eugene and I have been around, we're not particularly young, we've done stories with our horrible things in them before. Um, but we're just saying, actually, I'm not feeling very good this week. And he said, no, I'm not feeling very really good. And he'd been talking to his wife and she'd sort of noticed that he was off. And I'd noticed that I was a bit off as well. It's like, oh, 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 that'll be because you know, we've been marinating in other people's horrific trauma for a week, um, you know, very intensively um, on top of months of low key marination, uh, marinating in this stuff. Um, but no, but I, I would never, never pretend that, 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 um, you know, that we, that we suffered in any sense like that, but you know, I was a bit over it by the end of it. It was like, I don't want to think about these horrible creeps and these nasty things they did and, and the horrible things that humans do. God, pe people are awful. You know, people are just, can be so very awful. Um, however, <laughs> you know, as, as it's coming to a, to a close in New Zealand, we've got the Glory Vale um, thing unfolding and there are just so many parallels. Um, you know, I, I, have, you done a, have you done an episode on Glory Vale? I haven't, I haven't, but I know that there is a lot in the news about happening. about yeah. Gloria Vale at the moment. So for anyone that doesn't know, it's like a secluded Christian community, fundamentalist Christian community in some isolated part of Australia. New Zealand, yeah, but bottom New... bottom of the bottom of the South Island on the west coast. Um yeah, uh, led, uh, I think he's dead now, but um, for a long time led by a literal convicted sex offender, child sex offender. Um, yeah, that's true. I was just checking, am I defaming anyone? No, no, that's, no, that's, that's, that's the Glory Vale, Glory vale background is, is accurate. But um, I don't want to do anything about Glory Vale. But um, the point is, these stories d aren't going away. There are, you know, there's, there's always a new, a new crazy thing coming down the, down the pipe. Um, I haven't got any plans at the moment, but, um, there are, you know, there, there are stories out there. Um, Eugene and I, um, do have a, um, another podcast coming out very soon. If this is out in December, it might already be out. Look for something called True Story. True Story is our new podcast and it should be out thoroughly by, by the time this goes to air. Um, and it's not, it's not a narrative podcast. It's uh, each episode telling an independent story, it's much smaller scale um, and a little bit more, not, not as heavy. Some of it will be heavy, but you know, real mix. Some, one, one, one week it'll be quite quirky. Another week it'll be um, investigative. Another week it'll just be science-y, you know, it's, it's a, quite a general purpose sort of feature audio storytelling. Um, but, uh, it's really, it's really rewarding doing these, these monster projects. Um, there are lots of individual days or weeks or even months where you're thinking, this is horrible. I'm really sick of this. I'm never going to see the end of this process. These documents, this transcription, can't find the storyline, all those kind of things. But um, you do a big thing and it does... Um, just from a work perspective, it has longer after echoes. It um, you know, it lives a little bit longer, and that's really satisfying. It's really rewarding making something a little bit bigger. So, um, and I've really enjoyed working with Eugene. I think that the two of us, at some point, might find some other big thing we want to do again. But uh, we're, we're quite hopeful about this new thing, True Story. So we'll see how that goes for a little while. It well, be, I suppose really, there might be a few years in that if we're lucky. It's a bit lighter in content for the majority of the episodes in that that 
series as well, I imagine, in, in comparison to things like The Commune and mm. uh, and things like Gone Fishing as well, for example. Um, True Story might be a little bit easier on the on the old mental health, which we always need to make sure we're being uh, yeah. mindful of. But do people well, come well, to you and say, oh, I've got this story, I've got this story? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, from time to time, um, uh, one is always cagey about these things, but no, just, just the other day, somebody, I got in touch and said, Hey, you should do a story about this. And I got in touch with them and thought, actually, this might fit in not this, cause you know, we've, we've got this first season of true story pretty much lined up, but this story is like, could it be, could, mm, could it be a narrative podcast maybe, or maybe we could just do one really, really good single episode. So. Um, the nice thing about working on a fast turnaround thing is that you have the opportunity to get in ahead it move. Whereas once you're locked into a big project, um, you can, you know, you can be in the middle of the swamp up to your knees in mud and thinking the other side of the swamp's a long way away. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel as though you've learned a lot about the nature of cults since doing your project and sitting down and spending so much time with Barry? Oh, unquestionably. Um, and of course, there's a whole pile of other stuff that never makes its way into the podcast where you just, you know, she's rattling off names of cult researchers and people who are influ influential on her or, you know, the, the those books from the 1970s, which um, were used as rationalization for, for dubious um, child sex things. And um, so you read all the stuff and uh, Inevitably, your brain gets full with all sorts of things. But in particular, I was really fascinated and it was properly new to me. You know, I learned this in real time while talking to Barry and then reading about it afterwards. Just the, um, it'll be the stuff that you're, you're all over. Um, just the commonalities, the, the, the fact that, you know, if you get that formula of, of, of a bunch of people, certain, degree, certain types of vulnerability, um, certain personality, certain power structures the same things keep happening you know? <laughs> they and you and those those cult, those cultic checklists and i had no idea about those i found that really fascinating um i mean i guess you you're doing that with 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 a lot of journalism you are doing that you're trying you're, you're always trying to find the general and the specific and the specific and the general you know you're looking for the case study which exemplifies this broader principle um because both things matter you know, you've got to zoom, keep zooming in and zooming out. There's, I think it's a bit in the podcast where we talk about that. You know, the um, we've been telling you these terrible tales of individual people and their ter their bad days, but you know, we maybe we just chose these people bad. You know, we just chose the bad stories. But then, like, nah, there's this great big research project. Zoom out. You know, one third of children had had experienced um, sexual abuse, and you know, I'm getting the stats wrong, but you know, so it's that moving between the fine scale and the grand scale between the statistical and the, the, the highly specific and personal. Um, that's really fascinating. And so the way Barry drew out those strands, those generalities was, yeah, it was a revelation for me. It was fascinating. I think I hear your personal revelation throughout the 12 episodes that I've had over these kind of 200 or so episodes with with uh, uh, survivors and, and experts on when I started the show, I had that mentality of, you know, how could anybody ever do this or how could anybody ever know that or suspect that there was abuse of children taking place? and not do anything about it. And I mm. felt like I almost heard your own brain mm. going through that process of listening to Barry's story and understanding how and why and all of the undue influence that she was that she was experiencing and the hold that Bert had over everybody in that community. You know, they really did mm. see him as their messiah. Um, and, and Barry kind of really goes through that. and. I was like, Adam's going through that thing I went through yeah. where you get to the end and you have actually some level of compassion for Barry where you're oh, like, yeah. 
and and she's going through that herself and and I think that's really beautiful that you hear that in the podcast that she's having all of these revelations as well and understanding that she has to give herself some level of compassion and and understand that yes she did know or suspect that these things were taking place um and you know it takes a while but she really gets there towards the end and now she's going through these processes of reading about cults and coercion and reading Dr. Yanya Larcher's books. She's a good friend of the show. So um, mm-hmm. I was really happy when her name was was popping up in the podcast as well. So Barry really, as you said, is so intrinsic to the storytelling of the commune. And um, yeah, I heard you kind of, wow. Well, the, the, the thing with Barry, of course, is that, you know, she's in a, she's a, actually, there's a mistake in the podcast. We say that she's in her seventies, but by the time I came out, she was 80. It took so long, but um, she, you know, it was a long time ago. She's still living it. Um, and she has told her story to herself and, and, you know, in, in documents she's written and so on so many times. So in actual fact, that journey that she sort of, you know, apparently went through in the course of the podcast, that's somewhat reconstructed in that the first time I sat down with her, I talked to her on the phone a bit, and she has worked, she has functioned as a, a, a sort of a, a media front for, you know, her wing of the, the centre point, um, the post centre point machine, if you like. So she's quite an experienced um, media person. But I went to meet her and sort of sat down for a pre-chat, really to discuss whether or not, because she was unsure if she was going to go on mic or not. Um, and she actually pretty much gave me absolutely everything from the beginning of the podcast to the end in, in about two hours. And my head was exploding. It was like, what? <laughs> I didn't, I, you know, everything she said was totally coherent, but there was, it was so dense and there was so much to it. And I was scribbling down notes and I just thought, what are you doing? What? And that guy, the trust, the, it didn't follow it. It was just so complex. And then, you know, later we did, I think, three long interviews with her. We must have interviewed her about 12 hours or so. Um, and then when I looked back at my notes from that very first meeting, it had all been there all along. It was just, I couldn't comprehend it because it was just so, so compressed. Um, so in a way, our job for Eugene and me, our job was sort of, um, yeah, just decompressing this kind of, this m- micro dot package that she gave us in that very, very, very first conversation. But the other thing you're saying about um, sort of da- my dawning re- uh, realization, of course, Again, there's a little bit of smoke and mirrors there in that literally everything was co-written with Eugene and me. So we did all the interviews together, broke up pieces of research, broke up, you find those people, I find those people. Da, da, da. Um, and at the writing time, we structured it together. And then we sort of did alternate, wrote alternate chapters. But it's just kind of, from his point of view, it's this weird ventriloquism because, you know, it's it's all stolen in the first person but there are great big chunks which are just and you know Eugene wrote them and I read them out basically so it's a composite um human journey that you're witnessing when you hear me get wow it. it's 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 Eugene too but and that's a really that's been one of the joys actually of working in podcasts as compared to feature writing journalism is always somewhat collaborative but it's quite common that you find a story you interview someone you parse it you write it, you hand it to an editor and the editor tweaks it or improves it or changes it or makes it worse. But it's quite linear and that's that. But working with Amy on Gone Fishing and then with Eugene on all these other projects since, um, it's a real joy, the collaborative, you know, cooperative and tensions as well. You know, the, the, the arguments that you might have are really fruitful and enjoyable. That's so funny that you you said that Barry wasn't sure whether she was going to go on the mic. (laughs) (laughs) That's the best thing. Oh, Barry. All of them talked. You'll have talked to more cult cult survivors than me. Um, Everyone at Centrepoint, they could, I mean, in a, in a good way, if anyone, if any of you are listening, this isn't me complaining, but they could all talk the, what is it? The egg off an iron pot. Um, unbelievably hyper articulate, um, partly as a consequence of the environment of the place itself. You know, this endless uh, quasi bullshit therapeutic environment they worked in, some of which was bullshit, some of which was sort of kosher. So much talking, so much, um, 
so few constraint, you know, really open about talking about sexual things, um, which in a weird way made some of what they're talking about easier because they weren't beating about the bush. They're saying this happened, this, you know, it's kind of a bit graphic and awful, but it's also very clean. Um, I don't know. So, some of the qualities, a lot of people a lot of, got a lot of good things out of Centre Point, but one of the qualities that a lot of people got from it, I think, is this incredible articulacy and although then some of them might be really quite screwed up, um, emotional openness and emotional articulacy as well, which is a bit of a gift when you're interviewing people. So after listening to hours of, of Herbert Potter's rambling on, you weren't convinced by any of his rhetoric? <laughs> Not by his rhetoric. I mean, you know, he said some things that, that were c correct, like it's not good that the whole world has got uh, enough nuclear weapons to blow each other up. Um, and, uh, you know, some aspects of Victorian sexual morality are a little bit bogus. <laughs> a lot of what he said was actually just really banal, actually. So you like, didn't find any of it sort of like there were no revelations in there for you personally? <laughs> oh, I'm just going to pause to give a non-glib <laughs> answer to see if there's anything. I'm just going to give me a moment to think. <laughs> I really don't think so. I mean, to the extent that there'd be a sentence that he'd say that I'd think in those tapes, um, oh yeah, fair enough. It would always be something which is, you know, either banal or a truism or a rehashing of something that I've already encountered in a, you know, the lifestyle section of a Sunday newspaper, which is, you know, you should take time to be mindful or um, uh, it's important to uh, let your children have the freedom to make mistakes or, you know, what... Uh, you know, he didn't say live, laugh, love, but I don't feel I got a lot more out of him than I would have got from a live, laugh, love poster. Mm -hmm. That's interesting, isn't it? Just after hours and hours of listening to him talking in the way that he did to the people that followed him, that in this day and age, in this environment, in this mindset, there's nothing in there that stands out for you. Whereas the people at the time listening to him in the conditions that they were under, perhaps with the substances at some points in the story that they were taking as well, would have been like, oh my goodness, this is the most thought-provoking, truest and and most comprehensive thing I've ever heard. And I just think that that in itself is really, really interesting. Yeah, it's a little bit sad. You know, I think I have some, um, there's, some there's something that a lot of the kids said, which was like uh, going to the commune when they turned up and it was like, you know, it's a big swimming pool and it was physically quite comfortable. and um, lots to do and and a lot of freedom and bush to play in and all that sort of thing um and a lot of them said it was like a school camp and then realizing that it it wasn't going to end and that's kids but i think the same thing applied to the adults to some extent and if you remember that that euphoric assuming you have good experiences of school camps that euphoric feeling of turning out with a bunch of people and it's just it's just getting the energy off everyone and there's no you know the rules are a bit, little bit different and it's exciting and in, yeah, it's it's euphoric, and I think that was one of the things that Barry said is a is a common cult thing. So, it's not. I I don't know if everybody sitting there listening to bur burbling on thought, oh my god, this is this is straight from the the mouth of of the most awesome thinker I've I've ever met in the world. I think even in the in this in the magazine, they were even sometimes quite funny about it. They're sort of you know referring him to to him as a sort of a cut rate Jesus or you know whatever. Um, they could see his flaws, but they, it still worked for them. It's like, yeah, we've got to listen to his bullshit for that. But you know, it's really comfortable on this bean bag and I'm, and I'm cuddling up to this woman who's very attractive or this man who's very attractive. And I like that. And I like the fact that there's a nappy roster and so I don't have to change my baby's nappies so often. And I like the fact that the food is cooked communally. So, you know, a lot of boxes could be ticked and it's like, if I have to listen to Bert's bullshit. I don't, it wasn't Bert's bullshit that pulled them in. It was everything. It was the full wraparound experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, think, I guess. And again, for people to really get into all of that, then there is the 12 part series, which is available. So please, Adam, can you oh. tell everyone where they can find you and all of your work and all of the other work that you're, that you're, peers oh, yeah. are, are working on too yeah well so the commune itself dub 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 dot stuff actually do you say that in in 
England. I just remember because I lived in the UK for a while and then I got back to New Zealand and people said dub, dub, dub. And I thought, that's weird. We say www. Do yeah, say we do say www, but I thought you were just being cool and edgy and cutting it it's down. Not cool you know? edgy. It's, just, it's just one of those incredibly boring, random, <laughs> tiny vocabulary differences that you get between two countries. Um, yeah, it's not, it's, it's not an interesting one, like the difference between a trunk and a boot and a bonnet and a you know, no, but we do have tea and bickies, so there are some things across the Commonwealth exactly. that are universal. <laughs> and we are rather more English than American, but to be honest, my kids are so TikToked up that they their vocabulary is um, possibly more more American than English. Anyway, tea and bickies. Where were we? Um, dub dub dub. Okay, I'll I'll make it easy for an international audience. www.stuff.co.nz slash the commune or one word uh and then you'll find the commune there and links to everywhere and all the usual you know all the players and stuff or search for that inside your players and then the other place to go is stuff.co.nz slash podcasts and that's a general landing page for all of the stuff podcasts that have been made and are being made and will be made so the commune is there gone fishing is there um eugene's the district is there um eugene and uh, my out of my mind is there the mental health one eugene and my tick tick and coronavirus nz are there and very shortly true story will be there and then there's a bunch of other excellent um podcasts made by various people at stuff uh, actually there's one that you might have encountered because we were advertising on the commune but um it might be of interest to you it's not quite cult land it's not quite coercive control land um but the lake um it's god if you thought that the commune the things that people did in the commune were terrible the, the lake is pretty terrible um but it's kids who ended up uh through failures in the state um sort of the state welfare system these children who ended up in this adult psychiatric institution called lake alice and it's also a story about uh colonization actually in the end because a lot of these kids are maori kids not all of them but a lot of them are pacifica and, and maori kids um but it's it speaks to that same issue of of you get a bunch of vulnerable people in a position and then give people um, infinite power over them the odds are there's going to be a baddie there's going to be a bad apple who's going to use that infinite power for for pretty malign ends so but it's a hell of a podcast you know beautifully made um and really interesting that was it there was an external production but stuff um, was involved um yeah so that's on there as well and Stuff I imagine that they are all of, of, a, of a particular quality as well. And I know that we were put in touch by our friend, our mutual friend, Sarah Ferris of Con yes, in the Con cool. and yes. Stop the Killings and all of her amazing podcasts that she has. But Conning the Con is quite similar in, in the way that the story is constructed and the way that the elements of, of, of each thing play out, you know, a, a limited series around mm. her sister mm. being uh conned by a serial con artist yeah. and then both deciding to take the ultimate revenge against the con man which yeah, it, which yeah. was really interesting so it was it was nice for um sarah to put us in touch so i just wanted to put mm. a nice little thank you and shout out to sarah ferris sure. in this episode she's my podcast mum. i i call her um nice. she takes me under her wing and looks after me so thank you for that sarah and for the introduction and I think, I think she's in New Zealand um, later this year, early next year. So I'm probably going to meet her in the flesh. So. Oh, wonderful. That'd be great. Oh, she'll be, she'll come back to England with 10 new podcast ideas. I doubt. <laughs> wonderful. So there are some links I will put in the episode description so that people can find all of the things that we've talked about today. I know that I listen to the commune on Spotify. So uh, there, there is that option as well, um, as well as every other podcast player that people might use. I really would like some listeners to go and head over and have a listen and then come and have a chat with me about their thoughts and feelings because unless it's for research purposes, I don't tend to really spend time outside of work looking into 
to cults and and cult like environments. But but I knew our interview was coming up, so I listened to the podcast, and I'm so glad I did. But typically, I wouldn't think I'm going to go and find myself a podcast about cults because, of course, you know you don't want to spend your whole life doing the same thing over and over isn't that the definition of madness so um can't can you call it work time can't you say okay i'm now working very hard listening to this podcast from new zealand yeah and washing the dishes at the same time or you know putting the kids to bed or whatever whatever it is so um yeah so i i was just really glad that i did and i'd love some listeners to go over and, and have a, a listen check it out or if you've already listened then then let me know what your thoughts and feelings were and i also thought that Bert potter looked a little bit a little bit like David Berg, uh, founder of the Children of God. Um, so I just wanted okay. to throw that Google, out there. Right? You, can, you can use the magic of editing to um, make my Googling sound faster. Da- How do you spell Berg? B-E-R-G. Oh, yeah, okay. David so, Berg. Oh, well, he's, got, he's certainly got a lot of beard. It's the hair and the beard, isn't it? I think that's about it. I mean, I know that that's what a lot of cult leaders have looked <laughs> like or people from that time. But yeah, I just um, first, because the cover art of the commune just made me think of David Berg. Well, what's what's kind of funny is that Bert had a few different looks and an actual fact, this is n- the the main image that's been used of him. It's, it's an incredible image because he's looking right down the barrel and he's and he's got this wild hair he, and he's got these big mutton chops. I think this must have been really quite an early image, maybe, um, you know, like 1979, 1980 kind of thing, because um, later in the 80s, when I became aware of him, uh, he had slightly, slightly less crazy hair. But anyway, that's not very interesting. You might want to cut that as well. That was totally boring. <laughs> um, no, I, I'm just looking here and I see exactly what you mean. But yeah, he quite often just looks a, a little bit more well, he still looks rather like a 50-year-old um, businessman who has just um, caught a little bit of the, the informality of the 80s and has let his hair grow a little bit. But he doesn't look like a wild crazy. Yeah, that's that's classic, that photo. Yeah, that's classic. This is a wild picture. For anybody that's listening, I've just Googled Bert Potter. And to actually see the, the residents or members of the commune all together in one picture that's actually quite haunting there are so many people here in this picture so many children tiny tiny children wow though we for a number of reasons when we didn't use a lot of images and all the images we we basically um sort of blurred and anonymized a lot of things so i mean there's 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 more stuff on the internet actually i don't want to say that i'll stop there um Wow, yeah, these are all on the Stuff website as well, these these pictures. Um, I've just realised I'm just scrolling through Google and it's all... Oh, yeah, the, uh, those, uh, those ones associated with the, with our pieces. Wow, amazing. Brilliant. So thank you so much, Adam, for your time today. It's been wonderful to speak to you in real time instead of just listening to your narration through my headphones. And I know that it's late over where you are in New Zealand. It's the morning for me and I never interview in the morning. So this is certainly a change of pace. And I just appreciate you, your time and explaining to the listeners and and anybody who might stumble across this episode, the time and depth and energy and thought process and everything that goes into actually putting together 12 episodes doesn't sound like a lot, but it's clearly a lot. So I appreciate you giving us a look and some insight into the actual work that goes into a project like this as well. Well, thank you. Well, thank you for thank you for being interested. And um and yeah, nice to have a quick chat to Liverpool in the in the middle of the night. I I I found the podcast really a great addition to cult education, cult awareness, and uh, yeah, just an insight into some people that are alive right now that have some incredible stories. Barry and Robert being two of them. So thank you so much for your time, Adam, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. I will. I shall. Take care. Bye. Bye. That is the end of this mini-series on The Commune. To find Adam's work, follow the link in the episode description or search for The Commune across your podcast player. To get in touch with me, you can find me at coltboltpodcast at gmail.com or follow me on Twitter and Instagram at coltboltpod. Going into 2023, I wish you all the best of luck and a happy, healthy new year. 
I'm your speaker, Casey, host of the Cult Vault podcast.